Hello, hello. You're tuned in to the Paul Leslie Hour, and we are pleased to present the return of vocalist and recording artist Steve Tyrell to discuss his new album, Shades of Ray, the songs of Ray Charles. Hello, hello. How you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Can't complain. You've got a great background behind you. I didn't think about it, but... There's a, see who we have there. We got Dolly, we got Bird, we got Ray, we got Linda Ronstadt, we got Frankie Valley, Dionne Warwick, Jack Nicholson, Elton John. and Elton John. Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> we could say American music. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is with much, much excitement that I announce the return of our guest, Steve Tyrell. He is one of our best singers in American music, and I can testify he's a great performer and entertainer, a Grammy and, award, and Emmy Award winner. Mr. Tyrell is a record producer, songwriter, music supervisor, a radio host on K-Jazz, a great vocalist, and he's got this great new record out, brand new. When I heard it, I was floored. Everybody knows that I love Ray Charles. The title of this album is Shades of Ray, the songs of Ray Charles. Steve Tyrell, it is a great pleasure to have you here, an honor. Thank you, Paul. It's my pleasure to be here, man. It's wonderful. So Ray Charles, I think, is one of the all-time greats in the world. And I know that- That's, for, that's for sure. <laughs> Tell me- why did you think that the time was right to come out with a Ray Charles, to pay tribute with Ray Char to Ray Charles on an album? Well, he has been the biggest influence on of my singing and my music since I was in high school. You know, I mean, the first time gigs I had in high school trying to pick up girls was singing "What I Say" at the Hop. You know, and uh, so I've always loved Ray. I've always respected Ray. I had the opportunity to work with him a few times and to write a couple of songs that he sang on uh, some of his albums and, and other people's albums. So it's just something I always wanted to do. And I really, quite honestly, it took, it took the pandemic <laughs> to give me, make me do it. You know, every time I'd start, I'd go, I don't know, man, I don't know if I'm good enough to be even trying to do a Ray Charles album. You know, you don't see many Ray Charles salutes. You see a lot of salutes to different artists, you know, over the over the years, great artists like Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole. And, but you don't see many salutes to Ray Charles. That's because he's so awesome. We're all scared, scared to try it, you know, but I'm happy with the way this came out. What are your recollections of being in the studio singing these songs? Uh, well, they're all in my heart. I mean, I didn't have to listen to Ray's version to, to sing them. You know what I mean? They just, they were in my soul. I, ever since I first heard them, I, I remember when he released uh, Modern Sounds and Country and Western Music, I was in high school. And... Uh, that that album changed my life, and as I got in, as I got to know Ray, he said that um, the record company didn't want him to do that. They thought that it was not a good idea for him to try to sing country songs. Meanwhile, it was one of the biggest albums of all time, one of the most respected albums of all time, and it proved to me what I already knew that Ray Charles could sing anything and sing it at the highest possible level. You know, so there's there's a lot of great singers in this world that do what they do, but Ray could do anything, and every and he did too everything: country music, standards, blues, you know, jazz, whatever. He could just when he sang it, it became a Ray Charles song, you know. And I have to say that that's reflected on the record the the variety of stuff. When I saw your show, this was from a couple years ago when you were at uh, city winery in Atlanta, mm -hmm. I was reviewing the show afterwards. And I said, you know, Steve Tyrell, he could sing a country song and 
like like nobody's business. And Ray Charles was also someone. So many of these songs on here are country songs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that album, Modern Sounds and Country and Western Music, uh, that Ray Charles album, I think it's, I read somewhere, it's uh, Rolling Stones had one of the top five albums of all time, you know. So can you're you, right. Can you recall one of the first Ray Charles songs you heard on the radio or on a record? I don't know, man. I got a woman. Could all those early ones, you know? I got a woman. We tell it's good to me. I mean, that was a good one. Uh, what I say, of course, you don't know me. Hallelujah! I just love him, love her so, you know. Um, let the good times roll. All of those songs. I don't remember which ones I heard first, but they. He did a bunch of rhythm and blues songs. And uh, when he first started, my favorite Ray Charles songs were on the old Atlantic label. And uh, so I had Warner Brothers owns my records now, and they also owned the old Atlantic label. So this, re this record, Shades in of Ray, I had Warner Brothers put it on the Atlantic label. So when you buy this record, it's very cool. It's on the old uh, Atlantic label that Ray Charles first recordings were on. I think that's a nice little touch. <laughs> well, kind of like you, I, I like to dig in, in music and I like those little connections. I like to go back and listen to stuff. I was listening to recordings from CL and the pictures. Yeah. And, and, and also Andy, that album, that Ray Charles album, my mind, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's, let's have a look at it. Uh, but the, I know that you performed Ray Charles songs back when you were doing CL in the pictures gigs. Yeah, that was my first band that I ever was in, you know, and um, we used to play these kind of in Texas that, you know, they, they had a lot of, there was a lot of rhythm and blues and all, and the bands played a lot of R and B. We played, you know, Ray, uh, uh, Bobby Blue Bland was big in Texas and one of my all time favorites. Uh, by the way, here's that Atlantic. This is the label that Shades of Ray is on. <laughs> That's the same label that Ray was on when he started. Anyway, thought nice. you'd like to see that. Um, anyway, what are we talking about? I forgot. Oh, yeah, we were talking about uh, CL and the pictures in those. Oh, yeah. Well, they, the guitar player was a guy named Charlie Broyles, and he was a friend of mine, and they, they played a a club, a kind of a blues club in Kima, which is outside, it's a, outside of uh, Houston. And they played five nights a week, or no, six six nights a week, I think. They were only off on Sunday nights and, and packed that place every night. And uh, so I used to go to ride to the gig with him. I was in high school, man. And uh, I would sing to the radio and, and stuff. And he said, man, you ought to start singing with us. And, and I said, well, y'all already got a singer. He said, no, no, we, we could learn a few tunes and you could sit in with us. And that's, so that's what, what I did. I learned some songs and they would call me up on the bandstand, CL in the pictures. And then CL was a great guy, man. He, he was a great singer himself and he was not at all worried about another guy singing in the band you know he was very confident and he should be he was great and uh, so they opened let me in the band with open arms and then the the guy the label they were on they were they were a big group in houston and uh, they were on a national label and uh, the guy that owned the label said you you should make a record too and we'll we'll make a record with you so i made my first record when I was in CL in the pictures. And then that began to, my career as a singer. We were talking a little bit before we went on air about the great background behind you there. You've got some photos with, we could say you and, and the people of American music, but can you tell us a little bit about some of these black and white pictures? Can you see them back, I back there? I mean, some of them. These are just some of my, you know, I used to have a studio 
and uh, for years in on Sunset Boulevard and uh, in in Hollywood. And uh, so I gathered a bunch of, you know, a lot of people recorded in my studio with me. So these are just basically snapshots, mostly from that time. Uh, well, let's see who's on there. I don't know. Ray Charles and me, Aaron Neville and Linda Ronstadt recorded in there. I produced Don't Know Much, that song with her and uh, Aaron that won, I don't know, five Grammys or something. Rod, Rod Stewart's right behind us here. You can't see him though. And uh, Elton and all of those big Frankie Valley. Bird Backrack was a big supporter of mine. Dolly Parton is back there on the wall. Jack Nicholson, I did a song with him. In, in a movie called Something's Gotta Give, you know? And uh, so that's that's some of the guys back there. Let's see if I'm forgetting. Steve Martin is back there. Nancy Myers, because I sang in their Father of the Bride movies. Dion Warwick, who I started with. So I just took some of the pictures that I used to have in my studio and put them in my little office here. So I, I can remember all those great times I had with those wonderful people, you know? Man, <laughs> now since we've been focusing on Ray, and uh, they can see sometimes that that picture of you and Ray Charles, what was it like being in his presence? It was great, and the the you know he was my hero, and a lot of times you meet your hero and you're disappointed because it's not what you, he's not what you thought, you know you made him built him up so, but Ray was everything but that. I had. Uh, I had written a song. I worked on a show. I did a lot of movies and television music too. And I had worked on a show called Frank's Place in the 90s and uh, with Tim Reed. And it was really cool. It was about a, 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 a blues bar in New Orleans. And the jukebox was like the star of the show because he played all this great music. And I was in charge of all the music. And um, Ray Charles got a hold of uh, Tim Reed and told him that he loved the show and uh, complimented him on it, you know? And so the next show that he got was a show called Snoops, where he and Daphne, his wife, played these detectives. It was star like Nick and Nora Charles, you know? It was kind of an a African-American version of that. And they were these detectives solving, solving crimes and the show was called Snoops. So Tim asked me to write a song for, for the theme song, you know? So I wrote this song called uh, Curiosity, but these Snoops. And uh, I really, he really liked it. And, and I said, well, man, why don't, you, why don't we call, see if Ray Charles will sing this song. And, uh, and Ray had never done a theme song for a television show. He was against it. That was like beneath him, you know? So I sent him, I, he called, Tim called Ray. I sent him the song and uh, he liked it. He said he'd do it. So he came over to my studio. <clears throat> and from the time he came to my studio and the time that we sent him the original version of the theme song, um, he, uh, the CBS, it was on CBS. They, they changed some of the opening pictures, titles, and they made us, they asked us if we rewrite some of the first verse, different lyrics, because they didn't match these new pictures. So we did. And Ray comes over to sing the song and he says, uh, he asked me to play the track. And I did. And he said, hey man, where them words come from? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> CBS asked us to change a couple of the lyrics. He said, well, ain't nobody told me that. And I said, well, sing whatever you want. Sing the whole lyrics. You're Ray Charles. What are they going to do? Fire you? You know, <laughs> they're thrilled that you've agreed to do this. He said, no, I'll tell you what, man. You and me will go. He said, who's that guy singing, by the way? I said, that's me. And he said, beautiful, man, beautiful. <laughs> so uh, he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I don't have my machine with me. He didn't have his Braille machine. So he couldn't change the words in Braille. He didn't have it with him. So he said, uh, I'll tell you what we do. We'll go in the studio, you and me, sit across from each other, and you sing me the new words line by line. 
And every time you, you, you sing a line, I'll sing it back to you. And I'll sing it back to you 10 times if you want. And then you just put together the best version with the right words. So I actually sat there and gave Ray Charles line readings, line by line on that song. And that was the first time we worked together. And that's a bonus track. That's the bonus track because it's never been on a record on my Shades of Ray album. It's called Curiosity with me and Ray singing back and forth, trading lines. And so it, was, it, it, it worked out all these years later that it got released, you know. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing, man. It was amazing. I mean, can you imagine sitting right there and singing? I don't know, one funny thing happened. When we got to the bridge of the song, I thought I had come in on the downbeat. And uh, so Ray sang it and he came in after the downbeat. I said, no, man. I said, you need to come in on the downbeat. He said, well, you didn't come in on the downbeat. And I said, I said, uh, I think I did. He said, play the tape, man, play the tape. And he played, I played the tape and he was exactly right. I came in, where you leave, don't you know I will follow? And came in after the downbeat, you know? And he says, and he laughed. I said, yeah, you're right, Ray. He said, I know I was right. <laughs> he said, why don't you let me do the singing and you do the producing? <laughs> and we got a big laugh out of that. But it was one of the happiest days of my life, actually. Trading out lines with Ray Charles, one by one. And it's on this album. That version is on this album as a bonus track. It's called Curiosity. And then I did a, another movie with him later with a song I wrote for him and Diana Ross that I produced. And, and that went on his Genius Loves Company album. Yeah, Genius he, Loves Company 2, I think it was. And that's uh, Big Bad Love. Yeah, right. And you have a version on this Shades right. of Ray record. Right. You sing it as a duet also, like, like Ray did. Uh, a great, great singer. A great talent. You and Nita Whitaker. Yeah, she's wonderful. I met her from David Foster. She, 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 David, uh, my friend, he produced a lot of stuff and a lot of the things he did for Whitney Houston and different people that he produced, he would have Nita come and sing the, the scratch tracks for him. So I, I met, I heard her first from David Foster. And so I asked her if she'd sing this with me on my record, you know. I couldn't ask Diana Ross. She'd already done it, you know, <laughs> with Ray, but that's how that happened. Well, what was it like for you go going back to the Ray Charles and the, the Diana Ross version when you heard that the first time? When I heard, when I produced it, I was yeah. there when she sang it and Ray sang it. What, what, is that, what's, what's the question? What, yeah, when you listen to the final, because I was listening to that today, the 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 Ray and Diana version, and it's just a an, also an incredible duet. What did you think when you heard the final, the finalized version? Well, I did, first I produ I put Ray Ray sang it first, mm -hmm. and uh, so I taught the song to him. And I originally thought that it would be great to have Ray and Aretha do that song two greatest R&B blues singers of all time, but Aretha wasn't available. And so I asked Ray about it and I thought about Diana Ross. I produced an album with her and I think she's great. And I, and I thought the contrast of their voices, Ray's big, bad love and Diana's sweet thing would be good. And I, I mentioned that to Ray and he loved that idea. He thought that was even better to have him sing with her. He thought there was a better, bigger contrast between the two singers, and and so he was a big he was a big fan of us doing it with Diana, and so I did Ray's vocal, and then Diana Diana came in, and this is Diana Ross, the supreme diva of all time, you know, <laughs> and it was she was so wonderful, you know, he, she came in and she was like singing to her idol, you know, wow. she was she was she was sweet. You know, she really wanted to get it right because that was Ray she was singing with. And she had never, as big a star as she was, singing with Ray Charles was a big deal for her. As it should be. Well, speaking of duets, another 
cut from this Shades of Ray record, you do a duet of one of the greatest rhythm and blues rock songs of all time. Hit the Road Jack with Charles yeah. Gibson. Yeah. What was it like doing that iconic song, Hit the Road Jack? Well, uh, Charlotte did a, did a great job on that song. She really, she, 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 I was getting the idea of how to do it. And I had worked with her. She, she was like a, you know, she, she was pretty known in LA. And so I asked her to sing the girls part and she just killed it, man. And I you know, stopped right there. I just had to do my side of it, but it's mainly the girls part is the, is the, but you know, the most important part of the song. Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back no more. What'd you say? You know, so she killed it. And it was, I was, I was thrilled with her. I, she started out by singing it as a demo for me. And I didn't know who I was going to get to sing the girls part, but she did so good that I didn't want to, I didn't want to explore any other possibilities, you know. You know, singers and recording artists, they're always fond of saying that picking favorites is like picking children. But yeah, I, if, can, I, <laughs> if, I can see that. If you can tell me your favorite, I'll tell you my favorite from this record of yours. Oh, man, that's that's almost impossible. You know, I would. I love Born to Lose. I love Georgia on my mind. I love. I love Let the Good Times Roll. That has a great spirit and a great way to start the record, I think. So I don't know. Am I Blue? That was another version of Ray Charles's singing that I really loved. Of course, what I say is what I say. You Don't Know Me is, I, is probably the one that I get the most requests for. Uh-huh. Is well, that, is that one of your... You don't know me. I thought that was a that was a grand slam. Well, thank you. I play it every night on my gigs. People love it, and uh, and when it shows something too. That song was written by Eddie Arnold, yeah. great country singer, and uh, Ray just made it his own. And it's it's one of the most. I'd say I'd say you don't know me is one of the most special tracks on the on the whole album. It's beautiful. Um, but, I'm glad you like it, man. You know, the last time we did an interview together, the the last and the only other time, you were saying in there, you said something like, "Ideally, you get better with each record that you make when you're a recording artist." You should. I mean, you should. You learn more. You know, and I don't know. I, I, if I said that, I, I know that you should. You should be getting better, or why do it? <laughs> they were let him just keep playing the old ones. I don't know. I think this is my best album, honestly. I don't know what you think, but most people it. like my first standards album to be that's the the very first one, you know. But I think this this thing was a you know, to tackle these songs by Ray Charles and to be happy with the way they came out. And I wouldn't have probably ever finished it if it wasn't for the pandemic. You know, but I'm sitting home doing nothing. I said, hey, let me let me get back into this Ray Charles album and finish it. And I did. I'm glad I did. And Warner Brothers wanted me to do it. So a lot of people contributed to me making this Shades of Ray. But look at this. La this label is the coup de gras, isn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine? Nice. Now, you know what's fun? What's amazing? My first album was uh, was on Atlantic as well. And I used the same label. I love this label. It means, <laughs> it, it touches my heart. There's some of the greatest music. Aretha was on this label. You know, there's so many people were on this label that I admire that uh, for Warner Brothers to let me use the old Atlantic label was a thrill. And it was my first album was also on that same out label. Just a little something that's, you know, meaningful to me. I don't know if it is to anybody else. Definitely meaningful. I can't resist asking you about this. He was my all-time favorite guest, and you did two duets with this man, God rest his soul. 
And I'm hoping you can tell us what can a singer learn from Frank Sinatra Jr. Oh man, Frankie was my buddy. He was my like brother almost. He came out when I made my first standards album, the new standard. Um, I got a call one day. Well, I listened to my voice messages, you know, and I got this most complimentary call from somebody who said they bought the album and they loved it and they loved the arrangements and it was very serious. Frankie was kind of serious, you know, and uh, and he told me he he complimented the arrangements and the selection of songs and and uh, the whole thing. And then at the very end of his of his uh, wonderfully flattering. Uh, phone call he said by the way if you'd love you know if you'd like to get a hold of me this is Frank Sinatra Jr. I'd love to talk to you and he left me his number and I called him back and I, I almost drove off the road you know because I'm Italian <laughs> and if my mother knew that the Sinatra and I've become very dear friends with all the Sinatra family and if she my mother knew that she'd come out of the grave and dance around in a circle you know because uh there's no, the Italian people, especially, well, so many people love Frank, but me being an Italian boy uh, and having that, that family kind of adopt me as their fam in their family was a dream come true, you know? And Frankie helped me with that whole album, Songs of Sinatra. Uh, he wrote the liner notes to it, gave me a couple of arrangements. He sang a tune on there with me. And uh, he's been, he was a very, I miss him, man. He was very, very special in my life, as Tina is and Nancy is. And Nancy Sr., we just lost her not that long ago. Like, seems like yesterday, but it was probably a couple of years ago. And, of course, Frankie, he's no longer with us either, you know? Hmm. So, But I, 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 I talk to Tina all the time, Tina Sinatra, and Nancy occasionally, too. Somebody that you produced, I think, another person we just lost is one of the great, great singers of all time. Do you have any memories you could share of B.J. Thomas? Sure. I started with B. I got a job working for a company in New York called Scepter Records, and I moved to New York. And uh, the lady who owned that company, you know, we had Dion Warwick, we had Burt Backrack and Hal David. And, uh, and BJ was my friend from Houston. And I always thought he was the best singer down there. And when, as soon as I got to New York, first thing I did was tell Florence Greenberg, the lady who owns Scepter, I said, I got a friend in Texas we should sign to the label. He's big in Houston, but he could be big all over the you know, world if he could be heard. And she said, okay, just simple as that. If you think so, let's sign him. And I, signed, I called BJ. He had recorded a song with his band in a little local studio in Houston called, and the song was called I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. <clears throat> and I picked it up for Scepter and we released it and it became like a top five record in the United States. And then from that on, uh, you know, we, we did Hooked on a Feeling and the Eyes of a New York Woman, and, you know, and all those songs of rock and roll lullaby and raindrops of course you falling on my head so we had a run that that really helped start my career it really did start my career and it started his like everything i did for bj he did for me by just being successful at it you know so by all his first records uh, i worked on with him and what what a sweet sweet man yeah, he is. He was. I mean, I have him in my show. If you get to, if you guys come out and see me, I do a little special little little spot in my show that I honor my friend B.J. Thomas and uh, sing Raindrops and and also Rock and Roll Lullaby. Any producing projects for you coming up? Well, not anything I really want to talk about because it's not finished. And I got one, you. Of, one of them is a, you know, is a major, major artist that I've worked with a few times and we're working on something right now, but 
he doesn't want to reveal it until it's finished. You know, he doesn't want to reveal what it is. So you'll, you'll find out about it. It'll be out this year. In good time. Has there been any artist that you always wanted to work with that you haven't yet? No, there's a lot of artists like that, man. But I, it doesn't mean that I can't love them. I don't have to work with them to love them. But there's a lot of great people. I mean, I, I love Don Henley, you know, and, and uh, became friends with Glenn Fry. He, he, uh, Glenn Fry bought my, the record company, I told you, was on Atlantic, called me, my first album came out. He told me that Glenn Fry bought a hundred copies of it. Mm. And I said, really? Yeah, for what? <laughs> and he said, he gave it as his Christmas present and with a bottle of his favorite wine. And um, since then, you know, I've seen Cindy Fry, and I saw her at, uh, at the, in Don Henley's last performance. And uh, she told me, as Glenn did, that they they used to dance around to my first album at their house. It was very special to them. So I wanted to work with Glenn. You know, he made a standards album. I wish I could have worked on that with him. And he he was somebody that both of those guys, Glenn and Don, um, are two of my favorites. I wish I, I wish I would have worked with, but to have it didn't, they, they didn't need me too bad. I mean, they did okay without me producing them, you know, both of them. I want to encourage everybody, please check out Shades of Ray. Go on stevetyrell.com. Also check out the radio show, the Steve Tyrell right. show. That, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I've been doing this for five years. It's my own show and I don't always have to be there. I mean, I can do it from the road too, you know. It's uh it's K Jazz 88.1 Los Angeles. If you're in Los Angeles, you can put it on the in on the car radio. But if you're anywhere else in the world, you you can listen to it, uh listen to us on jazzandblues.org. And uh I'm on drive time in Los Angeles, five to seven, five to eight. And uh, so you have to if you're in if you're in New York, it would be 8 to 11, you know. But it's it's live 5 to 8 in Los Angeles. And whatever that equates, if you're in Oklahoma City, maybe it's 6 to 9 or so. I, you know what I mean? Right. But, yeah, every day, five days a week, KJAZ, 88.1. Well, do you have any parting words for our viewers or listeners before we go? No, I hope they get a chance to listen to this uh, Shades of Ray album. I think it's, I mean, I love the title. The title yeah. came right out of the blue. You know, it's a lot of it has just been something I always wanted to do. I'm proud of it. I don't, you know, it's my 13th album. I don't know how many more albums you get to make, but uh, I'm very proud if, if I don't ever make another album that just, that I did this one. So I hope that you guys, you know, you can download it and listen to it there's plenty of ways to listen to shades of ray and i hope uh, your audience does and that they enjoy it as much as i did making it thank you so much sir a great pleasure my pleasure thank you for having me paul on your show man an honor until next time adios amigos adios you know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by listeners and viewers like you. Uh-huh. Just go to www.thepaulleslie.com slash support, and we thank everyone who's contributing. Video editing by Kumar. 